Hello there. Listen, this is the Thierry Henry episode of Soprano Season 6, ladies and gentlemen. This is the number 14 Thierry Henry, the GOAT episode. I haven't even seen it. I'm calling it the GOAT episode, but you get what I mean. The number 14 episode of the Soprano Season 6, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ellie Moses, a 24-year-old law and film shit in here in Sydney, Australia. Absolutely shitty as shot at today. Like I said, episode 14 of the Soprano Season 6. This one is titled Stage 5. We're going to get into the reaction. We're going to have some fun with this thing. We're going to absolutely smash it let's get into it so i uploaded episodes 8 9 and 10 of the sopranos my reactions and i think it was episode 9 or 10 that you guys let me know that the actress that plays kelly is cara buono who plays uh mike wheeler's mom in stranger things and i searched that up by myself and then you guys told me in the comment section but like i can't believe like i it took i'm like I literally looked familiar and then i clocked up I'm like that's her and you know 20 years later the result is still the same it's super mario smash bros ladies and gentlemen <laughs> i'm not gonna lie yo she good looking fam <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, she aging better than the wine Tony has been drinking. Yo, I need her genetics. Ew. All of y'all will agree with me on that one. Come on, come on. Is this Angie Bumpmancero's body shop? Frankie, where are you? Is this a movie? This has got to be a movie. Oh my gosh, that's Predator settings right there. That's Predator 2. That's got to be the Predator. That's got to be the Predator. Come on. Oh, but the spine ain't ripped out. Ooh, chest burster. Uh, it's too low to be a chest burster. Let me theorize. Let me have fun with it. Or oh, some whacked off humans. Oh, it's Cleaver. It's the horror movie. No way! This is Chris's movie! That's the boss! Welcome to the chop shop, Kuji! <laughs> oh, they in post-production. <laughs> you can't kill me twice, Sally boy. I'm already fucking dead, remember? I'm the boss, Michael. What you had belongs to me. Even the girl I loved? What's mine is mine. What's yours is mine. I thought that was Alec Baldwin when I first had a glance at the guy, but no. Fuck Ben Kingsley. Danny Baldwin <laughs> took him to fucking acting school. Okay, it is Danny. Okay, Very it's, well directed. It's Alex's brother, I think. I think there's potentially more money in this than in the porn we've done. So what do we think? We need the extra scene or not? I like it the way it is. I don't know, Chrissy. These audiences today love blood. I tend to agree with Carlo. I'm thinking one more sexy kill. When Michael follows Centrella to the strip club, what if he chop up one of the women? Who was Faith would have it, was at one time Sally Boy's mistress. Two extra shoot days at a minimum. Kid, if it buys us some bullshit theatrical release, I'd have to get more money from Tony. <laughs> now, this fucking thing out there. Is it like. Yeah, T, what's up? You talk to the guy with the air mattresses? <laughs> I'm in editing. We just saw the cut of Cleaver. And? <laughs> awesome as is. The lawyer called, though. We might have to change the title. The Eldridge Cleaver Estate. They want an injunction. Damn. Listen, you want to see some of it? We're finishing the ADR after lunch. What's that again? Sound dummy. <laughs> Just call this dispatcher. It's a, it's a holiday weekend. Thousands of people be out at the beach. I'm on it. You coming down? Please. You don't give two shits about production. It's a little boring, I gotta say. I mean, that was surprising to me. It's fun, man. Cusamanos. Is that the Cusamanos? No, no, it's just a happy... Oh. Does Mr. Johnny Sack have cancer? How are you today? Isn't that for you to tell me? Lobectomy, radiation, goddamn chemo. What was all that? <laughs> the kicks? Those were our options at the time. And now, what are our options? Limited to the extent that I wouldn't recommend any. At this point, we're looking at stage four small cell carcinoma of the lungs. Damn. It's not stage five. That's correct. Um, difficult to say. I have seen miracles over the years. Forget the miracles. Three months, give or take. 
Alexander and the airplanes back to Springfield. How you doing, John? That's a bombshell and a half. It's funny. Ironic. Each other. I got here. I quit smoking after 38 years. Exercised. Ate right. And for what? Even still. It was the right move. Is it me or did Chris want to get like a I know they got an Asian director but like I cannot help but think they wanted like a James Wan wannabe or like a James Wan-esque director like another like an Asian guy like you get what I mean like Oh it's my girl how are you sweet mm -hmm. I'm very, very sick. Oh my God. <sighs> Don't cry. Fuck! You Don't gotta cry. do this to me, man. Make it any harder than it is, huh? No physical contact, please. Oh, shut your ass up, man. I love you, John. I love you too. Daddy. <laughs> Ladies, no contact. You come back, you see me again tomorrow, we have more time, huh? Yeah. So I'd like to compare something here to season one. And I know I'm taking it way back. And I want to... Pause it, but I love that cutaway shot to the long shot, the long wide shot of just Johnny J Johnny Sack in his medical robes right there. From what he was as an individual, obviously. Can I bomb one of those? It's casual though, right? Yeah, um... I just want to talk about the sort of depiction on cancer in season one with Jackie Senior and how they sort of dealt with Jackie Senior's death. It was sort of like, I don't know if it's dramedy, but it was sort of played off, not in a comedian. There, there was jokes made around it. The boys came in to send him off and, you know, like on a high note, they joked around. Um, but, uh, and obviously the funeral um, from memory, it was a typical Sopranos funeral. It was like when the show, like when the boys were in gear, right? Like when it was when I feel like it was at its height in terms of like the mafia operating the way it was. Um, but as the season slowly progressed, you see like in Tony's observed, they start to fall like dominoes, man. Each person um, slowly starts to fall off. And, you know, as people die by natural causes in this show, um, you know, Carmine Senior, no, not Carmine. Yeah, Carmine Senior, Ray, um, and was it Ginny who died of a heart attack on the toilet like Elvis? Um, as all the soldiers started to fall off due to natural causes, not part of the game, I feel like the show increasingly just got more depressing. And this season in particular, or season 6B so far, um, has taken the darkest tone probably thus far the show has. Um, even in the color grading, um, the color grading is so washed. It's so bleak. It's so dull, especially in the scenes right there with Johnny Sack. It's a depressing mood, and it, it's just sad to see. Even, like, Ginny's hairstyle is black. His daughter's hairstyle is black. It's just everything is just so lifeless, and... Um, at the same time, you know these people like Johnny Sack, he's ordered various murders, he's probably committed murders in his life, he's, he's a criminal, you can't help but feel sorry, like, it's just the situation, the people affected around him, um, and it's just, oh, this show is just the way it's ability to be so layered and complex, it's the same with The Wire at the moment, but like, you just, you, you can't help but feel sorry for Johnny Sack, but at the same time, you got to remember to yourself, and the show does that at points. It tells you, um, listen, stop. Remember who these people are. Remember what they're capable of. But at the same time, like, it's just, it's the sad state of Johnny Sack, you know? Like, he, he was a heavy man. He was the boss. Like, you saw the suits he was wearing, and then it's just, the, the, oh, man, the decay of a man. Cousin's movie premiere. We should dress accordingly. 
what they call a cast and crew screening. <laughs> in the city, Tony, with an after party at some rooftop bar in the meatpacking district. That place is very chic now. Meatpackers? I'm a happily married man. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's not dress up. Speaking of dress up, Christopher told me Kelly is having her wedding dress made into an outfit for the baby to be christened in. Oh, sweet. That's cute. You all right? You taking a date to the screening? If I can meet a normal guy, maybe. Whoa. Whoa, oh, whoa. Was normal? I don't intend to discuss Finn. But said our Birkin. What about that guy in your MCAT? But what the fudge is happening? Have I missed an episode? Like, episode 13 is where. Episode 13 is where Bobby and Tony went at it, right? That's the last episode I watched. I'm pretty. I gotta double check. Now my chest. What? Whoa. Wait, wait, wait. I literally want to check this. Yeah, Soprano Home Movies. That's the Lake House one. The Cheaper by the Dozen one. What? Bro, I'm tripping. I'm tri See, this show has that. It has that in it. It has that ability to, like, have an episode where time passes in between each episode. Not seasonal time passing. Episode time passing. And it'll put the characters in certain positions. Or, like, meaningful events will happen in characters' lives that it just... It, it doesn't brush over, but, like, there'll be in a different state of mind and stuff like that. Well, like, Meadow and Finn, obviously, the engagement's off. Like, they're broken up. It's done. It's halas. Like, and Johnny Sack, obviously, the time jump with him and his condition, only having three months to live. I don't know if that's... I don't know how the audience feels about that, but that's typical Sopranos because it's done it throughout the seasons. Um, And I guess... I don't know. That's the nature of life. I guess it's just so abrupt and I feel like the show makes it abrupt in its presentation. Um, I guess to showcase to the audience that anything can happen at any time. You know, we're not just going to make you live through these events. Okay, we're going to focus on Tony and um, his things. But because there are so many characters in this show, um, not all of them, or like we're not always going to see all their problems. It's the same thing with Kelly coming out of nowhere and being pregnant. Blanca seems to be upset with AJ here and very moody. It wasn't normal. I don't intend to discuss Finn. What about that guy in your MCAT review? Oh, please. He's completely fixated on his OCHEM final. Oh, he wants to be a doctor. Tell him it's educational. Body parts all over this movie. <laughs> hey, screw the movie. I just want to hang with celebs. Why? You think you're going to get to sleep with Paris Hilton? What? No. <laughs> Stop fidgeting and eat your noodles. You know I get well, Where are you going? The bathroom. Jesus. Meow. You Meow indeed. I don't know. You don't know, really. Keep an eye on his time. You're AJ Soprano and you don't, don't know. He rests now, I'll see you in the morning. You should be on heparin. Excuse me? Listen to him. Check his ABG. I'm gonna have to ask you again to not interfere, Warren. Let me spare us the awkwardness. I killed my wife. Not that it's any justification, but I had reason to suspect she was cheating on me with her chiropractor. Jesus. Granted, I was uh, abusing cocaine at the time and alcohol, but I came home one day. Damn, this Shot is... her four times. Twice in the head. I killed her aunt, too. This is one of the darkest episodes of the series. Probably the. I didn't know she was there. Rolled. Everybody got problems. And the mailman. At that point, I had to fully commit. I guess we're in the medical prison, so... Why are you here, exactly? I've been accused of being part of a certain Italian-American subculture. <laughs> hey, I know who you are. <laughs> I meant, what's wrong with you? Well, <laughs> lungs. I don't want to meet you, actually. I saw you on Bill Curtis. What? I'm back on good then. Gupta? Fuck him. Oh, you've seen Rosen. They let me fly to Cleveland, my expense, you know? I saw him speak once at an ASCO conference in Georgia. Good man. But? but. <laughs> Actually, very few people know this, but he really can't walk on water. What was his prognosis? Three months. With the treatment you've had? 
What do you mean? You got a window of one to three years. Interesting. The metastasis. Two rounds of paraplatin, docetaxel, and platinol concurrent with radiation. Come on, any cancer inside you slow to a crawl. Why is he so fucking negative? We tell a patient three months, he lives a year. Who looks like a hero? <laughs> I'll see you around, John. You he take fought well. <laughs> wow, an interaction between two criminals. That was very human. <laughs> Soft care funding. Most of it comes about through a legal enterprise. Our pitch is this, and it's the same we gave Christopher Maltzanti. Maybe never mentioned it. If you or any of your people ever heard of anything going down, uh, Middle Easterners, Pakistanis, you'd be helping us a lot if you uh, you let us know. I think there's a word for that. Your daughter takes pre-med classes in New York? She uses the tunnels? Something to keep in mind. <laughs> you tell that fucking Polak to get here early and bring up the paper with her. Or she can go clean somebody else's fucking toilet. What happened? It's too dangerous. Has been for years. I Have can't believe attention, please. they're at a cinema screen. Welcome to the premiere of Cleaver, the story of a young man who goes to pieces, then manages to find himself again. <laughs> In all seriousness, however, I, I'd like to say a few words. There's some members Much here. Much like a child, a film has many parents. That is to say, many individuals who act like parents, or that by aversion, the film is... I, as an executive producer, am one of those individuals. Two more examples are here with me tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, my co-EP, Christopher Moltisanti, and our director, Morgan Yan. <laughs> yeah, hey. Um, I, I know you're all psyched to see the movie, so I'm not gonna give a big speech here. I just wanna give a shout out to the man who, without him, this whole thing would be impossible. JT Dalton. Anthony Soprano, everybody. Yeah. All right, go. Once he came on board, the whole thing fell together. And uh, all the other investors, too, plus my wife, Kelly, and our new baby. I love you guys. OK, then. Cell phone's off, and I uh, hope you like the movie. That's so dirty. That's so dirty. Hey! Give Mr. Yam his shot. I think that says a lot about, oh, I'm not sure if David Chase was having a go there. So like a fourth wall breaking moment as well in terms of like the amount of credit writers get per se. And that means nothing. I mean, funnily enough, I'm watching this episode just a few months after like the writer's strike happened and we know Hollywood got put to a standstill because of it. And I feel like the creative individuals and the creative minds behind the show deserve just as much recognition, if not more, than the actual people on screen, in my opinion. Like, obviously, the director and the producers, sometimes, like, they get the limelight a lot, too. Um, but sometimes directors come and go. They're not even, like, uh, mentioned. They direct a movie, and then they disappear. Or, like, you get what I mean? Like, here and there, they'll have, like, their five minutes of fame for that movie, and then never be to be seen again. And writers as well. But, like, sometimes... I, I, oh, not sometimes, I feel like all the time, the writers, the people who put pen to paper and literally create this whole thing, no matter how bad the movie is, they put so much effort into like, you know, um, creating something that's going to be put on screen and seen by millions. They deserve the amount of credit. So I feel so sorry for, is it JT Dalton there? I feel so sorry for him just to be thrown under the bus like that um, by Chris. And I know... Listen, he owed a lot of money to Chris, and obviously Chris, you know, um, no, actually, he, his money thing, his money situation was sort of squashed because he gave him the car, and he did the whole movie thing for him again. So, like, what the heck, man? The least you could do is thank the guy. Yeah, and I think David Chase might have, like, done a little fourth wall breaking moment right there in terms of, like, um, maybe throwing shade at the heavies that don't give credit to him, potentially.
<laughs> Sylvia. I'm just saying there's a- You don't a... know what? He's a fucking rat! But we can't really prove it. Oh, so you can argue with me now? <laughs> oh, it's just, I mean, he's practically like your own son. The I'm pussy sorry, scene. Son. I think give him a pass. I didn't ask you what you fucking think. Tony in the road. Son of a. That's you. No. <laughs> find where this pet son of Ante is, and you bring him to the butcher shop. You're gonna find pieces of this kid all over fucking Tenaz. In the basement, too. No, Paulie, don't be yeah, one of those. I'm sure he's fine, sweetie. I mean, he's a good kid. What you need is a man. Tell him to put it in the trunk. Yo, this movie echoing to everyone in this theater right now. You know how long I've been waiting to do that? The Guma, man. <laughs> oh, okay, that, that was actually, that was a class scene right there. <laughs> That whole sequence. Dad, that was neat at the end. The creepy figurine and the crucifix. I'm glad you caught that out, Sandra. <laughs> Very observant. The sacred and the propane. <laughs> There's a ton of people wearing t-shirts here. I told you. I, is it so horrible you look nice? I'm starving. I need to eat something already. I asked if you wanted popcorn. You want me to make your plate? Yeah. Come on, I need to see some famous people here, man. Where's the actors and actresses? What? I'll give you a wife. Come here. Fucking boss down in the cellar. <laughs> White man for home. Where'd you get that? I don't know. Not this big choice. <laughs> Seriously, though. I'm very proud. Whatever else happens, you made a movie, Christopher. Nobody can take that away. hundred years from now, we're dead and gone. People will be watching this fucking thing. You know how much Imperial Vodka I scored just from this party alone? I had a couple of cases put down in your car. Okay. Man. <laughs> Gotta get the PR buzz, baby. Hey, thank you. Hey, Danny. Hey, Danny, come here. Take a picture of us. Hey, this is just a this is the cast and crew screening. So the test screenings could be well, and then you get like a ten percent on Rotten Tomatoes. So we don't know how this film is gonna do. Listen, the box office. Do it. <laughs> I don't know if you know this, but the actors they don't make up what they say. No, it's true. Even De Niro, the girl told me. Just yeah. Damn. Right. Fucking liar. Excuse us. Excuse us. We had a wedding spoil with the feds, and now we got a film screening spoil with the feds. Actually, not spoil here. It's Danny's manager. I better go talk. He broke the terms of his bail. He probably didn't get clearance from the lawyer. There he is. Uncle June did. It's my brother. I don't stand in his way. Oh, there's your ringing endorsement. Hey, Tony. Back. Back. Good. You know Danny, yeah? Hey, how you doing, Mr. Yeah. <laughs> on the Jersey Turnpike. <laughs> Broke the woods, your wife. I said he should talk to you. I'll take care of That's not oh, necessary. Oh, let's take a picture then. <laughs> if you're Phil Leotardo, you cannot be happy with the state of affairs, despite appearances. You are all very excellent. Jerry, how are you? Meaty. So we were discussing the apparent mob power vacuum here in this New York This guy looked like Mario. Are you shocked that there's still no successor to John Sacramone? Not really. I mean, uh, the last 10, 12 years, that's been a dysfunctional family. And as Jerry said earlier, there are several viable candidates. Well, viable, I don't know. You had Phil Leotardo as the logical successor, but You he, also course... have Gerardo Jerry Tosciano. Also Faustino Doc Santoro, who I believe is the front runner. <laughs> then, I'm surprised you haven't mentioned Carmine Lupertazzi Jr. I was about to, Manny, before you interrupted. In fact, if you take a look at my book in chapter 14, there's a the Santoro thing. I called it a year ago. Change of power. And... Oh, I'm joking. So what would I like you to buy some stuff in the kitchenette? Ah, ah like clear a mind. Couldn't the least they do is support Ginny and like get her a house instead of staying in the motel? Or like, I know we still got half an hour on this episode, but Tony, come pay a visit to Johnny Sack, like. Let them share the screen one last time, or like, I don't know if he's going to go this episode, or he's going to have that one to three years, as the other guy was saying. Um, he could go out and take his own life, who knows, but like, it would be cool if Tony paid a visit. Like, I mean, Phil went down, 
But Phil seems... Phil, Phil's always got something to complain about. He's never content no matter how many times they make amends, per se. Um, and this episode's titled Stage 5. Now, initially when I thought and saw that um, Johnny Sack had cancer, I'm like, there's no Stage 5 cancer, is there? Stage 4 is the worst. And I don't know if it's titled Stage 5 because that Stage 5 is meant to indicate the unknown and the unknown for the audience, the unpredictability of this show, and to just throw things at you um, in terms of like, as the viewer, you're entering the unknown, you don't know what's going to happen, and the characters themselves don't know what's going to happen. Look at Johnny Sack, three months, okay, one to three years, we don't know what's going to happen um, with like the sort of relationships we've been told about this episode. One minute, um, one minute AJ and um, Bianca uh, Blanca are like, you know, the happiest couple ever. Next minute, they're in, they're having problems, it seems like. And Bian Blanca's hella moody. Um, one second, Finn and um, Meadow are gonna get engaged, and then now. Meadow seems to be back in town and she's going to med school and the engagement's off and Finn and her broken up. So maybe stage five is alluding to like, you know, that element of the unknown. We're, we're entering uncharted waters with the characters as well as the viewer. The reason I asked you here today, she's a bright kid, your sister. In business? <laughs> so, the guy I told you about. The wife murderer? He's still a doctor, Anthony. He was a highly respected <laughs> oncologist. I know, but John... He reviewed my case. He says I could hang on for years. You just never know. You're right. He still has the knowledge. I mean, OJ's no less of a running back, right? What would I do without you? A wonderful husband. A loving father. On the street, though. <laughs> From what I know, you were well-liked, John. Respected across the board, despite the allocution, even. God knows guys have actually named names for a hell of a lot less than what you were looking at. The only negative... <laughs> yeah, but it's probably... What? Uh, when Carmine died and you took over, people felt you changed. You came uh, a little trigger-happy, maybe? A hothead? At least he's being honest. God forbid any of them would find themselves in that position. It's a thankless job. Sylvia found himself as the boss in New Jersey, the acting boss, and my guy, <laughs> my guy had a panic attack. <laughs> what kind of a guy in the movie? What guy? The boss, Tony. What about him? It was based on you. No, no, you said the yelling. It wasn't just the yelling. <laughs> the to form a flattering. You think that was flattering? It was okay. It was a tough prick that ball with. What about the girlfriend? What girlfriend? The Cleaver guy, the lead character, his entire motive for revenge. I don't know, you lost me, Colin. Sally Boy, the boss, he fucked the guy's fiance. Oh, that's Aid and Tony. The thing with Adriana? I told you it never fucking happened. Oh. Well, apparently your nephew feels otherwise. A little sly Rome dig. pointed it out to me, but if she saw it, that means other people did. It's a movie. It's fictional. It's a revenge fantasy, Tony, which ends with the boss's head split open by a meat cleaver. See, I don't know if Carmela is intentionally triggering Tony here. Like, we, we've seen how trigger hope, happy Tony's been this season, making all the wrong decisions and sort of not giving it F and full sending it at moments. Like... It's fictional, but yeah, did Chris insert those little digs right there? I'm not sure. Maybe Carmella's right in that sort of portrayal, but like, oh, oh man, like, you don't want to remind him about it. Oh, there he is. Good time last night. Yeah, it was all right. How about you? No? Yeah, I bet fucking nightmares. All right, he's going for validation here I'm from sure. the other men. Here we go. He's going to ask Sylvia what he thought. So, uh, what do you think of the movie? You know, Chrissy's the last person I would have confused with Marty. But, I gotta say, it wasn't bad. That ball was pretty good, huh? He's a mean fuck, I'll give him that. And I caught her played the fiancé. She was hot. You know, the one he was fucking. Sylvia not saying much. Sylvia, I reckon, got the gist. 
creative process. I'm watching that movie, Edward Scissorhand, when boom, all of a sudden it hits me. What if instead of a pair of scissors, it's a meat cleaver instead? <laughs> Oh! Lady, you got a movie. Now, originally, I thought a uh, ball. Shoot him and Kevin! <laughs> What's up? You, man, it's like I'm living somebody else's life. You're just not comfortable with success yet. I know. It's scary. So, Kelly. Thank you. Good. Fucking great. She's a doll. She cries a lot, though. It's a baby, not Kelly. <laughs> I hope you're taking the time to. Reflect on all this. Saving the good stuff. Yeah. No, I am. Where you were just three months ago. You came into that meeting, you were so fucked up you could barely talk. And that woman friend was even worse. Juliana. I've been trying to do what you said. Pull back a little. Steer clear of old habits, same people. Must be hard, though. They give me a lifestyle. They already misinterpret. I don't want to hang around so much. Fucking poorly, especially. Have you explained how hard it is to be around alcohol? How familiar surroundings set it off? They don't give a fuck. In my life, Carmine. I want him dead, Jimmy says. He will be, so, but not, not just right now. He earns too much. Eight years later, Jimmy gets a call one day. Remember that guy we were talking about was fucking your wife? He can go. The guy wasn't making him money no more. And that was Carmine Lupatazzi. <laughs> Holy fucking shit. <laughs> Telling there the stories, the glory what? days. John, what the hell are you doing? What? You're smoking. So? Daddy, you're on oxygen. What about all these six euros with leukemia? What's that from? All that negative thinking? <coughs> <coughs> Just life, man. It's God's plan. Works in mysterious ways. You just gotta keep the faith. All due respect, he's a great guy, Doc, but boss material. Important things, we all work together. Whoever winds up in the driver's seat. Oh, that base Dolo. suit. Damn! Don't forget it. The man was my mentor. It was right there for the take. It's hard, Jerry. What's he gonna do? That's my point, though. What you just said. Johnny goes away. It's Phil's turn in the driver's seat, and his heart gives out. His heart. It's a poison chalice. I know. What? It's a metaphor. He lost his balls, is what I'm saying. Oh. Just say it then. Well, fucking whip me, <laughs> Ladies. Hey. I don't know. I We had a quattro gatti. This has got to be a dream, right? <laughs> Holy moly! <laughs> no, it's no. Who's this? Let's go. Bro, this is the craziest episode of Sopranos thus far. It's similar to the Goodfellas yeah, five times shooting. Five peace on uh, St. Louis. Who <laughs> said this? Was it Phil? Third person party, like no cap. I thought it looked like the director for a second of the movie, but <laughs> yeah, give me five times a piece on uh, St. Louis for the shoulder of both of them. Is this the same golf club Carmine had his stroke? This family of yours. I can see now Doc Centauri uses one of my guys as a diversion. Still could have got hurt. Doc showed a lack of respect. So it's fucking leadership, boy. So is Carmine orchestrating things from behind Step a little up, bit? Carmine. Get your hands around this thing. You know you got the support. This motherfucking cool who came out of nowhere. You never thought you'd mutter those words, did you? What do you want me to say? I hear you, Tony, and I'm flattered. But boss, I don't think so. Especially now that Doc has cemented his position. Bill was bad enough in the top spot, but uh, him I could have lived with. Here you go. It was time. 
I was obsessed with being in charge. You remember. Right. So do it. One night around then, I had this dream. It's my pop's 100th birthday, even though he'd been dead for years. The whole family's there, grandkids, everybody. He's wearing one of these gold paper crowns, like a burger. <laughs> anyway, I give him his present, this mellifluous box, ribbons. He opens it up. The fuck does mellifluous mean? This gaze of absolute disappointment. Every night, I come home from work, strip down, jump naked in the pool. Cole brings me a scotch and water. We sit, relax a little, talk. I go up to bed, the air conditioning. She brings me a light dinner, a tray. One night during all that fighting with John, I come home. I'm exhausted. So tired, so tense, I skip the pool. I go right upstairs, flop on the bed. Nicole comes up with the drink. She says, darling, I think it's time you took a rest. I say, I'm gonna, we're gonna take a vacation. She says, that's not what I meant. I don't want to be the wealthiest widow on Long Island. I want you to quit now. I'm not ashamed to say that she made me cry. That wonderful, loving woman. That dream with my father, the empty box, it's about being boss. It's about being happy. Life outside of the game. I like that little comment. I like that. That's what Tony Lauren, can't hi. have. He can't be happy. He can't How's just he doing? listen. Going up I and mean quit. To talk to you about the smoking. John shared with me how upset you were. Years ago, I asked him to stop being kids. I lost twenty-seven pounds. He couldn't quit smoking. <sighs> I gotta go. Can we talk about how this episode still has 18 minutes remaining and how much TV we've had in this episode thus far? Like, the pacing has been sensational and it's covered so much ground. There's so much going on. I've yet to process it. I know it's my first time watching. I'm trying to pick up on everything, but so much has flown over my head and I haven't even really picked up on who killed that guy who was sort of next up um, to take Phil's position. It's almost like... That position is cursed, man. The New York position. And the New Jersey boys just sit there and just... They need someone to take the reins, obviously. You need to make amends. But it's just violence on violence on violence. There's no peace at the moment. It's just war. <laughs> it's not good. Oh, goodbye, Caitlin. I'll see you soon, Muffin. Oh, my God. I love these little hands. Thanks so much for watching her. I think we're planning a coronation instead of a christening. <laughs> we all set? You know what? I better pee. I get to keep holding you. Oh. So how you doing? Tony said you got an offer on a house you built. Two, actually, yes. Ivana Trump. What? On the spec house? You know, I gotta be honest. I am very disappointed at what you did. What are you talking about? Oh. Your movie. With the boss sleeping with the other guy's fiance. What? Please, like that wasn't based on Tony and Aid? What? No. Carmela, I didn't even write it. Story by Christopher Moltisanti. Isn't that what it said up there on the screen? Yeah, but that's just for the Writers Guild health insurance. Oh, really? Come on, you can't be serious. She's an Oriental, for Christ's sake. No. Why would I hear from her? Would it be so surprising? She left me for some other guy. Is it any wonder? Her poor mother is so upset, she's practically delusional. She's convinced herself that Aid is dead. Her mother's an alky. You know that. Yeah, regardless, Christopher. You're my cousin, and I love you, Carmela, but I don't like what you're inferring here. Either with the movie or with how I treated Adriana. So good. Kelly this comes is... out, tell her I went to smoke. This is so good. This is so good. This is that that was such a fantastic scene. I swear, Chris and um Carmela have had very few interactions throughout this entire show. We're over six seasons deep. And they've had very few interactions. And right there, they showcased why they needed more interaction with one another. I mean, they're cousins. They're cousins for crying out loud. And they've had very few interactions. 
but Edie Falco right there um, just nailed it. And notice how they obviously shifted from like the wide shot of sort of like the opening of the house. It was like the wide long shot with Kelly, Christopher and Carmella. And when it came down to sort of the conversation between them, it was tight interchanging close up shots. And it was great editing right there because Edie Falco's facial expressions said a lot. You can tell like not the devil in her, but you can tell that like the cynical side of her was coming in there and she was inferring she was really inferring and it was great it was great like the whole family's a mess at the moment the There's new no york doubt. family how is... you doing billy bathgate I had it in the library i thought of you i don't know if you heard but jerry torciano he was hit last week in brooklyn cool. jerry torciano was all over the news they whacked him in some restaurant do you know him? Yeah. Uh, um, good guy. Yeah, he ain't making it out of this episode. Not good. I don't like you. Aggressiveness surprises me. I gotta concur with Rosen. Stage five. Appreciate everything you did, Mark. Yo, the actor who plays Johnny Sack has killed it this episode. Absolutely killed it. Who is it? You don't answer your phone? What are you, fucking stupid now? He probably thinks I put it in there to embarrass him. Why did you put it in there? It was an idea. I don't know. Who knows where they fucking come from? It was I an idea or an experience. Some asshole hit him with an apple. <laughs> It's bad enough that I don't get credit for my own ideas. Now I'm supposed to take responsibility for some shit that's going to get me in trouble? Fuck that, man. Humanitis Award? What's that? Humanitas. From the Paulus Brothers. For writing themes of socially redeeming... He's going to hit him with... Yep. Uh, Look out the window. You see a fucking Hollywood sign out there? Maybe you talk to your agent like that, but don't ever get fucking snippy on me again. Supposed to meet him. Wait here? The thing is, he left me a message with this fucking Verizon. Mind if I wait? He set up the meeting. <laughs> he set up the meeting. Night coke, please. <laughs> oh, it's good. Well, congratulations. I hope we're gonna see some money soon. Yeah. Never get involved with these people, man. As a writer, you can never tell, you know. You can come up with an idea. You don't have to like it's just gonna respond. I mean, just because I like something I think of doesn't mean anyone else will. Well, that's a challenge, yeah. It is challenging sometimes. Inventing characters, how they interact. The boss, Sally Boy, for example. His whole persona. Going off the daughter at Crawford and Bone yesterday. What's that? Mm. <laughs> Garson Kane in 1950. It's terrific. William Holden falls in love with. Crawford's girlfriend, played by Judy Holliday. The black girl, the singer. That's Billy Holiday. Although, Judy's character in the movie is named Billy, too, so I can see why you're confused. i never seen it. Why would I be confused? Anyway, the Sally Boy character is based on Crawford, sort of a big, burly guy. You know, love triangle, the cuckolding of Michael sleeping with the fiance. Very similar to the Holden Holiday dynamic. I don't know if he's talking out of his ass here to save himself. <laughs> what thing was your idea? Oh. Apologies to Garson Kanan. What happened to your head? What? Oh, uh, cabinet. Duh. Such an awkward scene. Such an awkward Crushy, scene. Chrissy, what time you were looking for? Ah. I mean business. I got too much at stake down here. You got something that belongs to me. If you want to get out of here alive, you better give it back. No, I'm no blowhard. Tell him. He's no blowhard. He's had people killed before. Once about six years ago, there was a strike. Shut up! You ain't gonna be telling nobody nothing pretty soon. Is this the movie? This is the image of me. He leaves to the work. Remember when he was born, I 
would hold him in my arms. An adorable kid, too. Talking about Christopher? Big eyes. You always talk about him more like a son. In some ways he was. I, I like this talk here um, because we're nearing the final episodes of the show and obviously this show has had an everlasting image and I find it a little bit ironic how they talk about this episode, Johnny Sachs talking about, you know, what is the image he's, he, is he going to leave behind? And obviously Ginny's brother was talking about how he was when he became boss and then obviously you have the crying at the sort of... Um, the, the the wedding you have the sort of um um what's it called the admitting to his criminal activity and not taking it to trial so does what does that say sometimes the last impacts are the most impactful the sort of like the 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 ones before death or like your actions before death leave the leave the most impact so like you could do something and something will be found out towards the end of your life that would completely neglect and everyone will forget the great things you did before all because of that one thing and i like how this episode tony's talking about you know his image and because the character of sally is based on him um you know film is forever that film if it goes to the big screen is going to live on for generations and people will continue to see it and is that and if obviously rumor comes out in the media and stuff like that okay this is based off tony soprano is this the everlasting image that's going to be of tony soprano this film is that because it's going to outlast him obviously so it's going to be interesting to see how this impact his decisions going forward now is he going to want to end with a bang like especially after his dad died he was little i used to give him rides i'd put him in a basket of a butcher bike and pedal him around back when satriales made deliveries I reminded him of that recently. He didn't remember. But you do. We had fun. All those memories are for what? All I am to him is some asshole bully. Your dad did you was like my me to him. A mentor. Yeah, but more than that, a friend. A fucking guy you could look up to. And the hope is that you pass that shit down. The respect and the love. I know I did with his fucking kid and he fucking hates me so much. I'm sure on some level he loves you too. Yeah? Take that home. Judge for yourself. Last five minutes should answer that question. I'm not going to do that. Not a horror fan? It's what you think that matters. He fucking despises Pretty obvious. He wants to see me dead. This is top tier Sopranos, man. This episode without invalidating your feelings, is it possible that on some level you're reading into all this? I know too much about the subconscious now. <laughs> Yo, no cap. I think this is probably the best episode of Sopranos so far. You what? Want more morphine, Daddy? But it, this episode wouldn't exist Ma. if it wasn't for what came before. Mother. Grandma? What, Daddy? Is he hallucinating? Is he a No, he could be. Sometimes they see people who've passed. John, look at me, baby. Oh, he's gone. John. Oh, he's still going. He's still going. That's it. He's seeing the light. He's seeing the light. You can do that when you're on my fucking team. <laughs> he's passed. How's John? That's why I'm here, Tony. John passed away late this morning. Cut to the white pool ball oh, as well. Fuck, you're kidding me. Oh, my, God. my only wish. A great guy, John. Sorry for your loss. Thanks. Honestly, that was for the best. I beat cancer, but I took him out. Ride the painted pony at the spinner wheel glide. Huh? 
That's out of line. Check with Moni. I'm on on him. I'm on on my dresser. And the cost is getting thinner. I bet you he. We're here to celebrate what would have been my brother's, your uncle's, forty-seventh birthday. Blow it out for him. I bet you he thinking about what Lil Carmine said. And Lil Carmine, obviously, we, we, we always talk about how he's sort of the idiot of the show. Or like he tries to use big words. I forgot what the term was. Mal, mal put it, I forgot. It's mal something. Um, but we always talk about how he's the one that sort of like, you know, he's the idiot. Or like he has no idea what he's saying. But I feel like the thing about happiness really stood out for me. And especially coming from a character like him. That's why I think it really stands out. Because he was right. And I think Tony is sort of jealous of that and tony's been jealous of the last few episodes i feel like he was jealous of um and at the time obviously I haven't uploaded the episode 13 reaction but i feel like he was jealous of bobby um not having to take someone's life before and the way his father brought him up to be i think he was jealous of that and i think he's jealous of carmine's ability to have that freeman uh fr freedom sorry little carmine's ability to have that freedom um and to quit when he needed to and to not take up the mantle and have those stresses and yeah i think tony is jealous of that and i think tony was really reminiscing about that stuff too and i find it also crazy i've been thinking about the christopher movie thing he started out about wanting he started out wanting to be a writer his aspirations about hollywood was him being a writer and people other people taking his ideas you saw it in the d girl episode um and it's funny how i find it ironic he's the one that they didn't even give credit to the writer when he's the one that had the dreams and aspirations of wanting to be a writer in hollywood here at this bar the nyc see, beef as well is a little hard to understand it comes out of nowhere world. a little bit more than shea stadium more than shea stadium he sit with his friends and tell stories about his family who he loved more than anything and was so very proud of his ashes will be right here so when his friends come to visit he can see them can you see us now yeah who knows who is Leonardo da Vinci? Maddie? Yeah, he wrote the Da Vinci Code. No. <laughs> Another man wrote that, but it's a hideous, sacrilegious book. When my grandpa came over from Sicily, they changed it at Ellis Island to Leotardo. Why did they do that for? Because they're stupid, that's why. And jealous. <laughs> they disrespected a proud Italian heritage and named us after a ballet costume. Marissa? That's for modern. In ballet, you wear tutus. It doesn't make a difference. <laughs> the whole family stuff. That's right, it doesn't. Can we have cake now? <laughs> Phil, there's kids involved, man. Just... <laughs> hey, man, the guy always goes on his rants. He can't hold it to himself. <sighs> he might do something stupid here. Why did I tell you? I fucking compromised everything. Nah, what are you talking about? 20 years inside. Not a fucking peep. For what? To protect the likes of Rusty fucking Milio? Doc Santoro? <laughs> You're a man, Phil. It's ain't a lot nowadays. That fucking piece of shit, Tony Soprano's cousin. I can't even say his name. I knew it. Murdered Billy. And what did I do about it? My weakness. Sometimes I think it's in my DNA. My family took shit from the Mitigans the minute we got off the boat. Come on. The fuck you talking about? Leotardo. That's my fucking legacy. No more for Oh, shit. Oh, shit. The bloody king, bloody keep it, bloody clean. Bloody chiefs, the bloody swine, bloody drums, the I talked about I talked about Tony going out with a bang and um Yo, Phil Leotardo might go out with a bang and I love that sort of 
high angle sort of th that camera shot that beautiful like medium long shot of him um the, the 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 sort of bird's eye tilted down angled camera shot um of him on the red table because i feel like that's all he's seeing at the moment he's seeing red and he wants to go out with a bang and i love how this episode's like one of the main themes of this episode is legacy and you know what these um mafia bosses think they're going to leave their behind what are they going to be remembered as and obviously phil leotardo is talking about his family's legacy his family's name what leonardo da vinci left behind what he's remembered as and i love that throughout this episode and obviously here you have one of the first times or one of the times um that non-diegetic uh sort of diegetic music is being introduced like a traditional score or traditional music is being inserted at the end that's not playing throughout the scene that sets the sets the mood of the entire scene really well <laughs> obviously you have the death the death of johnny sack juxtaposed with the baptism of um caitlin and he's looking down at the man he thinks that resents him his own son or like his yo i can just see it. tony gonna kill chris i'm telling you right now Damn, man. Damn, man. Oh, Maron. What an ending. Yeah, you feel like the fast, the fast paced music at the end there. Um, like, you know how it sped up um, with Phil dropping his bombshell. And then obviously that interchanged or sort of that dissolving into the scene at the christening. Um, I just feel like it's going to be all out at the moment. We're going into episode 15. Yeah. And like I said, I feel like it's just going to be all out from here. I think it's going to be absolutely insane. And I just feel like Chris doesn't have long left. I feel like Chris has had multiple chances in this show. And I feel like no one abides by the rule book. I feel like everyone has bent the rules. Um, and I feel like that's gone out the window. And everyone's bent the rules as they please. That doc guy, I think, got wrecked this episode. No repercussions, it seemed. And it seems like, yeah, no one is abiding by anything. It's it, it, There's no stability at the moment. Or whatever stability they tried to regain, it's just, like I said, flown out the window. And it's like no holds barred at the moment. It's absolutely insane. Listen, it's great for the viewer. There's so much to process. But at the same time, it's not going to end well if it's all out war. <laughs> and um, like I said, I just feel like, Chris has had so many chances to show, listen, if we're going by the rules of the game, the guy should not be here. He should have been whacked long ago, like long, long, long ago. And I just feel like even though he should have been whacked long ago, I just feel like if he does get whacked in the future now, I just feel like it will be for reasons that aren't by the rules, if that makes sense. Like he broke the rules before and he should have got whacked for those, but, you know, was saved because of who he is and the relationship he has with tony um but i just feel like yeah he's gonna if he does get whacked he's gonna get whacked for something that's like um like a veto for instance because of his sexuality like it's it's gonna be something along the lines of that where it's like sort of an unjustified whacking um but i don't know i don't know like i said stage five i'm guessing it's something to prepare for the unknown and that's what this show's I guess, gearing into or like it's what it's setting up for and it's what it's prepping the audience for. You know, get ready for the unknown. You don't know what's going to happen. And I love that. I love that. Top T television. Amazing. This is The Sopranos, baby. This is Ellie Moses. has been my reaction to episode 14 of The Sopranos season six. And yeah, I talked about it being the Thierry Henry episode. Look at the episode we got. Sensational.